Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Prayer cord, ring. And the reason that's why we call them cords was we wanted to give a picture of somebody who is uh, standing next to a safe full of money, but they want to get the cords right to open. You get it? What was the first prayer cord? We define the mystery of transgression in prayer. If I build the very things I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Hallelujah. So we showed how people transgress in prayer. You know, and that's another place of transgression. They didn't lie, they didn't steal, they didn't kill, but they transgressed because they built what was broken. And oh, they broke what was built. Hallelujah. And the second one? Watching in prayer. Praise the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Psalms 37, verse 37. The Bible says, Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. Amplified. Mark the blameless man, and behold the upright, for there is a happy end for the man of peace. The Bible speaks of a man who is perfect. Now, you must understand this before I explain a bit more on this, that when God has a certain mind, there are people who are trying to help explain certain things. And I try to show them something when it comes to the mind of God when he's relating with a perfect man. You get it? God does not relate with a Christian on the level of counsel at the same plane with purpose. You get it? When you're dealing with a little kid, eh? two years, then you tell them, don't eat that. You're counseling them not to eat, okay? But the purpose is that they do not eat because you know what it means for them to eat. But this is because they are a baby. You get what I'm trying to tell you? When they are old, you don't need to tell them, don't eat. Or if they are old and they make their own decision to eat, there is a difference in judgment on that level. You get it? That is why a kid can eat something and they die and then they arrest the parent. But a man of 18 can eat the very thing and he dies and they say he committed suicide. Because there's a responsibility that comes with maturity. The more you grow, the more mature you are. Some of you, there was a time your parents would not sit down to talk to you about family issues. But as you started to grow up, you realize that he can call you and tell you, hey, I'm planning to do this. How do you think we can do this? Why? Because at this point, your father thinks that you've grown enough to think with him. You get where I'm coming from? But there was a time you looked at money on the table and you asked him for money and he refused to give you money and you think, oh, dad is a very bad guy. How could he refuse to give me money when I need money? Yet that money was the working capital that he uses to get fees. But he could not explain to you that this is working capital for fees. Because that mind could not understand that it was working capital for fees. You get it? But now, when you mature and then you grow in gold to a certain level, you see the money and he tells you, I don't have money. You don't say how can he tell me they don't have money? Because now you understand that that money is used for? At that particular level, he can sit with you on a certain table and start to speak with you, pertaining his money. Why? Because now he knows another mind thinks the way he, he does. It's the same with this generation, our generation. Remember, the prophet said, or quoted God and said, come now, let us, Reason together. For even though you have seen his eyes, red as crimson, yet shall I what? Watch them and they shall be what? As white as wool. Okay? 
So when you get to that dispensation of the Old Testament, you realize that the biggest place of God reasoning with man was sin. You get it? Anytime he's reasoning with man, the underlying picture between the two of them was always sin. There is always sin. He expected the man to come with an issue of sin. Why? Because the old nature had sin above it. Or the old nature was subject to sin. So it was in that nature to respond in a way of its servanthood. And sin then was the master of that nature. You get it? And because sin then was the master of that nature. Every time the two of them came to the table, the master was discussed. And that was sin. You get it? Now, we're out of that dispensation, we're born again. And blessed be the man, the Bible said, of whom the Lord imputed not sin, but he imputed righteousness. Now, the new creature's problem is no longer sin. Why? Because they are, the Bible says in Romans 6, sin has no dominion over them. You get it? The old line was controlled by sin. They just wake up and everything they're doing is under control. You get it? They're under remote control to sin. They just think sin. They reason sin. Yes. So when God, by the time it gets to the point of reasoning with those men, they're always relating of sin. That's the place to reason. But the Bible says, now you are slaves than two. Righteousness. That means I wake up in the morning and I think right. I reason right. You get it? I can't wake up in the morning and imagine, huh, I'm going to kill this guy. You get it? I don't think anymore that way. Why? Because now we have the mind of Christ. Our meditations have switched course. Now when the very mind says, come now, let us reason together. You get it? Come now, let us reason together. He's no longer reasoning together with a man whom he expects to be subject to sin. He's reasoning with a man whom he expects to be above sin. Communion changes. We start talking about serious kingdom business. He says, now, I think this should be done this way. I think this should be done that way, because if we don't do this this way, we're going to do this way. I mean, we must do revival here. What do you think? I mean, God sits down with you. You get it? And then he tells you, I'm planning to revive Congo. Let's reason together. At that particular point, eh, sin is not the issue. You are perfect. You get it? You're old. There was a time you were young and the problem was that you eat sugar, stop eating sugar. You know, eating sugar is bad. Now you've left that level. You get it? Now you're at the level where now you're reasoning. You get it? You're reasoning for bigger things. Now God is expecting a generation that is reasoning in a bigger perspective. Why? Because the subject matter discussed between the two now is of men who are old. You get it? Now, in the time when you ought to be reasoning with God at that level, some of you are still in the primary things of reasoning. Please, God, please, don't. You get it, please, please. And he looks at you and says, oh, sorry, I mistook you for being old. God relates with every man to the level of their understanding. You get it? If he sees that you're a babe, he will love you as a babe. He will look after you as a babe. He will provide for you as a babe. You get it? He blesses every man according to the level of their maturity. He works with you as according to the depth that is revealed in your spirit. You understand? There are people God can't relate with in a certain way. You know, look at Abraham. I mean, he gets to the point and says, how can I hide this from Abraham? I feel shy. <laughs> he feels too shy. He says, how can I hide this from my servant Abraham? <laughs> He's going to be a mighty, great nation. How can I hide this? I'm planning to destroy somebody, but I can't hide this from Abraham. Oh God, Abraham, can I speak to you? Something is bogging my mind. Let's have a seat and then they sit over coffee. And then he starts to say, man, I'm to destroy Sodom. Abraham tells him, what do you think? Let me tell you. If you go to the Old Testament dispensation and see how God dealt with a man of faith, you'd realize that many Christians don't have relationship. They do not even know the God they are seeking. They don't even understand anything called God. They can hear a familiar spirit and call it God. You get it? Look at how God speaks to them. Oh, Abraham, you did this. Oh, no, 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 God. No, 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 no. Okay, let's talk about it. Okay, suppose there are 50 guys who are righteous. Will you destroy them? Oh, let me see. Hmm. This is God. Listen, this is Jehovah God. Discussing with an Old Testament man. You see where I'm coming from? This is Old Testament. What do you think we're going to do? No, 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 no. We're going to do Suppose they are 50. Ah, no, 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 no. I don't think. I don't think that way. 
I will not destroy them. Ah, uh-uh. <laughs> they laugh. Okay, suppose they say this. I will not destroy them. Ah, suppose they're twenty. I will not destroy them. Ah, suppose there's one guy in the room. You will destroy them. I will not destroy them. Ah, okay, watch out, please. Later. Conversation. One time I was reading the Bible, and I stumbled upon a portion of scripture where Sarah laughed. Do you remember? And then God asked, Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? And Sarah was in the congregation. She says, no, I did not laugh. God said, but you laughed. You said, oh God! Do you see how they're related? Why did Sarah laugh? And Sarah said, I did not laugh. I did not laugh. And God said, but you laughed. You laughed, Sarah. You laughed. You doubted. Anyway, this is what I'm saying. He went on his business. Sarah is a sinner. How could she lie that she did not love? I'm going to. You get it? <laughs> no, you see how it's done. Begin with verse 14. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a child. Okay? Next verse. Then Sarah denied, saying, I love not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou did love. You love. Next verse. And the man rose up fence and looked towards Sodom. He just did their own business. You get it? It's as though God didn't even see that Sarah lied. This was a relationship issue. It's like you're with your kid. Now, stop doing this. And you say, no, nah, nah, I didn't do it. No, you ate it. But anyway, that's okay. Come, come, let's plan anything. I was telling you, you see that? The level of thought. You get it? That's why you could lie. Oh, Sarah is my sister. And then the Lord strikes Sarah. Pharaoh comes to Abraham, you bad, you bad. You told me this was your sister. She's not your sister. She's your wife. Why did you lie to me now? I've been smitten. You see, and God's business and the friendship he has with, with Abraham is, okay, Abraham lied. That's not my business. My business is he touched the guy's wife. <laughs> God. But see how God says, you love. You love. Don't lie. He just goes with his business. And God to execute what he's supposed to. I know if certain men thought the way God thinks, that they think that he thinks. Sarah, come now to my office. Now, why do you lie? Do you know I can smack you? You little thing, pathetic. Do you know I'm even doing you a favor? You're not even supposed to have a child. But I'm trying to help you. And you're saying, no, I'm not even going to give you a child. Please, God, no, 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 no. I thought about it. I'm not going to give you a child. No, 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 no. I ain't going to give you a child. How can you doubt me? How can you doubt me? I'm not going to give you a child. No, no. But you see, God loves Sarah too much. And you realize Sarah did not die a liar. Because love, a multitude of sin. The number two, it faileth not. It doesn't fail. So at that particular level, as a father, as a father, you get it? A certain mind starts to form in your spirit. Paul says, for you had a lot of instructors in the Lord, but a few fathers. Okay, she lied, but that's not the point. I am building a preacher. I'm building a preacher. And the point is, yes, she's a liar. I can get lying out of this, but I want to get her to a point in God where we will even forget that she lied. Not that she didn't lie, but I'm her father. I can't deny myself. You get it? Because what I attend to, I give power. If I attend to her lies, I will give power to her lies. If I attend to the anointing upon her life, I will empower the anointing upon her life. So, when I ignore that, they'll say, he is promoting sin. No, I'm not promoting sin. I'm only conscious of what is wise. I'm only conscious for what is wise. Now, for example, there's some people who come and say, Apostle Grace, Brother Robert is a problem to us as a ministry. Say, hey, what's the problem with Brother Robert? You know, Brother Robert did this. You have to do something. I say, okay, cool. I'm going to think about it. And then they wait for me to do something. And they never do that anything. I just don't do anything. It's not because I don't want to do anything. I understand the mind of God. Look at the things you've done to God. And he doesn't say nothing. He just reveals himself to you more. He just reveals himself to you more. Because you're dealing with a bigger issue. I want to get to a point where I'm reasoning with somebody on the plane where I should be reasoning with God. You understand, friend? That is why if somebody says, Oh, Papa, I fell in this. I look at them and I'm thinking. I thought now you should be knowing that you're past that. 
You shouldn't be there. That's why he says, little children, when you sin, because those are little children, those are the peers. They are young kids. They can make mistakes because they are young. But there's a place where you're too mature to do certain things. So my disappointment is not that you did it. My disappointment is that I expected you to be a bit more older than that. So, what's my next part? To make sure I go back to your level and grow you out. Not attack you and fight you. Hallelujah. The reason is why some men of God have failed in this life is because they judged other men of God without the wise. Let me tell you a secret about the anointing. When the Bible says that he that is spiritual judges all things, but yet he himself is not judged by all men. It doesn't mean that that spiritual man does not make mistakes. You understand? It doesn't mean he doesn't make mistakes. It only means you're not supposed to be in a place of judging. And that's why the Bible now speaks for that man. He says, if a man is overtaken by fault, let you who are spiritual, who are not judged, but can judge, judge this far, restore. Because the highest level of judgment for a man that has fallen, and you're sure they're spiritual, is restoration, not judgment. And he says, in meekness, and what? Humility. Lift you yourself be tempted. What's the place of temptation? The temptation there is to judge a spiritual mind. That means there is a spirit in this life that is too zealous to judge a man of the spirit. And it settles on some Christians. Do you get where I'm coming from? The biggest place is restoration. If you're not mature enough to restore that man, pray for his restoration. Never be at a place of saying, that is why that man of God is failing. I said, the Lord is going to, no, 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 because the Lord knows how he deals with his ministers. The Bible says if they fall, they fall before him, not you, pastor. And the Bible says if they rise, they rise before him, not you, brother. And the Bible says he is able. Do you see his mind? He is able to what? Lift them up. He's able to lift them up. That means regardless of what you think, his business is simple. The guy has fallen. How do I get him up? Because the righteous man falls seven times. Seven times he what? Same thing for any spiritual father. If your child has fallen, the first thought is, how can I get them up? Why? Because when you're dealing with babies and they're young, when they fall, boom, you don't tell them, I told you, I told you, I told you not to walk away, but you did, you don't listen. All right, suffer it, and then you walk away. You don't. You don't. No, 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 no. You first dust them off. And after dusting them off, you say, don't go back, baby, don't go back. But they're up. They're up. Hallelujah. So even when we're speaking about Psalms 37, and it says, mark a perfect man, he's talking of another place of perfection if we are to go to the councils of how God defines perfection. You get it? So some of you think of perfection at the level of what you think is perfect. But when God says mark a perfect man, one, it means a perfect man exists. There is such a thing as a perfect man. But you must understand that in the counsel of God, there's a way he understands perfect man. Are you hearing me? There's a way he understands perfect man. How does he understand perfect man? The book of James is very clear. The tongue. The man's mouth. Hallelujah. Because he promised. For in many things we offend all. Okay? But he says, but if any man offend not in what? You understand? If any man offend not in what? Look at the counsel of God. The same is a perfect man and also is able to breathe the whole body. So the definition of God for a perfect man is a man who cannot offend in what? Offending in what means they don't make a mistake of misapprehending the what? That's perfect. Perfect means that you understand the word the way it's supposed to be understood. Okay? You don't misunderstand the word. You understand the word. And therefore, the moment you understand the word, it means you speak what is understood. And what is understood is the spoken truth. You're so aligned to hearing the right thing. Do you know how many men put their ears down to hear God and they hear another thing? Is it possible? Yes. Why? Because desire in them sometimes has bust a place of yielding to making a certain point in their spirit as according to what they feel should serve their purpose, depending on the spirit on them. Look at the man with the spirit of Balaam, for example. 
of which in the church of Pergamos now becomes the doctrine of Balaam. That spirit will want money. If it is listening, it will want to get anything that it can use to get money. You get it? And because of that spirit on a man, he will preach as much revelation. But at the end of the day, he will still... One time I was watching TV, I almost wept. A man was live on Daystar TV. And he was teaching and preaching and preaching and preaching and preaching. Then he gets in the middle and then he gives a testimony of a little boy who was sick. And the little boy got healed. But he used too much drama. Okay? Not that it was wrong to lose the drama. If it was to call a man to believe. But the problem with the drama was that it was to cause men to give. By the time he gets to the end of the guy's story, he says, I don't know about you, I don't know what you think, but if I were you, I'll get my check, I'll get that number, and I'll call and I'll scream, and I'll get some money. And I'm thinking, oh God, oh God, oh God. Now, healing, healing is causing men to give. But it's not causing men to give as it ought. Because remember the Bible says in the book of Luke, fruit in accordance to repentance. Right in the book of Corinthians, firstly, it's expedient that the heart be made up, not convinced into. You get it? The heart must be made up, not convinced into, not pushed into, not craftily manipulated into. And the next thing I know, men were calling in, men were calling in, and they were giving. The Spirit of God told me, none of those men can get increase because they're not giving in revelation. They're giving under a pressure of a particular spirit that knows how to deal with them craftily. And how many people don't even tell the difference? You understand where I'm coming from? So it depends on that spirit. But if a man is aligned to truth, hallelujah, you realize that the one thing he will never do is offend in one. So we go back to Psalms 37 and then he says, mark a perfect man. Mark a man who is blameless. Behold an upright man. For the end of that man is peace. It means that when a man understands the truth, he must have a certain end of peace. Do you agree to that level? The truth of the Spirit, the truth of Christ, is what produces the end of peace. Now, why the end of peace? I came from that angle to open your eyes to this. That if the truth is not in your spirit, you cannot make a certain prayer whose end is peace. You get it? If a certain truth is not in your spirit, you cannot make a petition whose end is peace. Because the place of your perfection means that you first have to get the balance of the truth in your life. So, if you've understood prayer code 1 and prayer code 2, you'll understand prayer code 3. If you've not listened to prayer code 1 and 2, you'll not understand this as you should. Because prayer code 1, we dealt with the balances of truth and where we err. Hallelujah. Now, we're at a point where peace is. And this is the point of prayer code 3. There is a point in God where... A man makes the ardent prayer that must produce the peaceable fruit or the result of peace in the man's spirit. And if that peace is not established in your spirit, you should not walk out of that prayer. You shouldn't leave that prayer until that peace settles in your spirit. But that peace cannot have the end if you're not a perfect man. And that perfection cannot come if you're not aligned to truth. You first understand the truth of something before you get the peace of something. Isaiah 26, 12. The Bible says, The Lord, thou will ordain peace for us, for thou also hast wrought all the works in us. You'll anoint peace for us. Why? Because you've wrought the works for us. There's a place where the end of a man must have peace. There's a place where the prayer that comes out of your spirit must have the end line peace. When peace comes, listen, it doesn't matter whatever is around when we're in Fort Porto, some of you remember they brought two people. Eh? There was a lady who couldn't walk and a young man. Eh? The lady walked and the young man did. Do you remember? The young man had the damage of a liver and the liver had killed all his body parts and he couldn't walk. But when I prayed for the young man, until the point I felt a certain peace, the peace that told me that now he's healed. Okay? I looked at this young man and we tried to make him walk, but all he could do was stand. So the mother was celebrating that for the first time her boy is what? standing but my picture was the boy was walking and a few minutes later they set the boy down and put him on a border and went while they go back to the hospital where they got the boy from 
because it was ailing, right? I'm seated at the meeting there. And the Spirit of God tells me, even though the boy has not walked, there's a peace in your spirit that this boy is what? Healed. I had now the strength to tell the guys, you know what? Follow up on that kid. I feel something is happening. I don't know why, but I feel something is happening. Because there was a peace in my spirit that is what? Healed. And as the Lord leaves us, these guys check on the kid at about 9.30. And they say that the mother said that when the boy reached the hospital, he told his mother, Mama, I want to walk. <laughs> I want to walk. The mother told him, walk. And the boy walked. You get it? But at that particular point, when they were putting him down, after he stood, he was not walking. And I could have lost peace in my spirit that why isn't he walking? You get it? But I have a truth that is aligned in my spirit to tell me, you shall lay hands on the sick. Oh, oh, oh. You shall lay hands on the sick, and the sick shall be healed. And when I'm praying, I felt the peaceable fruit. That's what James says in 3.17. The wisdom that is from above is first pure. And the place of purity is the word. And then peaceable. And then gentle. And the Bible says, and easy to be entreated. And then full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. That's the wisdom from above. It begins from a place of purity. And the place of purity is the word. And the next thing of purity is peace. You must have peace in any prayer. The end of your prayer must have peace if it's aligned to purity and truth. I don't understand what I'm trying to tell you. Never leave a prayer. Never come out of prayer until your spirit has peace. It doesn't matter the circumstance of somebody's disease. If your spirit has not felt peace, don't stop. But when it feels peace and you hear he has died, don't worry, he'll get up. He will get up. Why? Because that's the end of that man. Peace. The Hebrew shalom. Completeness. That's the place where you complete what you've started. The place that finishes the line of prayer must be a place of peace. If you're finished praying and you're still anxious, go back and pray. And when you come out of that prayer and you're still anxious, still go back and pray. And if you come out of that prayer and you still feel a line of anxiety, still go back and pray until your spirit is at peace. The moment your spirit is at peace, it doesn't matter what is surrounding you. But there is a first peace that comes from a carnal mind. In the world it's called positive thinking. Christians don't positive think. That's new age. It's not Christianity. Christians don't positive think. Christians truth think. They think truth, they don't think positive. They think truth. Even if it's negative, it's still truth. Hallelujah. So you work on thinking truth, not positive. Listen, Peter has said, we were born to a lively hope. The world has a dead hope. You understand? Dead hope is positive thinking. Yet it produces results. How much more? Lively hope. How much more lively hope? Why is it lively? Because it carries the substance of things hoped for. It carries the substance of things hoped for. I don't just go in the thing to hope. I carry something inside that backs everything that I hope. The Greek word for substance is material. That means you carry the material of what you hope for. Oh, <laughs> when you say I'm going to heal a sick man, I carry the material to heal the sick man. You get what I'm trying to say? I carry the medicine. When you say I'm going to build a cathedral, you carry the material. It's inside your spirit. It's not what they're building out there. No, no, no. That's just the manifestation of what is already inside your spirit as material. You ought to have the material. You ought to have the material. That's the essence of faith. Faith means that for everything you're praying for, you carry the material. If it's a job, you carry the ability. So you don't go to God saying, God, I might not have the ability, but you are God. No, listen, I swear, he will not give you that job. You're positive thinking. You're not truth thinking. Hallelujah. Why? Because the truth thinker must understand that he has been made your wisdom, your redemption, your sanctification. 
the truth being command to understand that in him is hid all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That means if wisdom and knowledge are in him and he is in you, you carry the knowledge for anything. The Bible says we have an action from on high. We know things. How can I get into a meeting of an interview and I'm thinking that I think less than the guys? It doesn't matter. You know, some of us who went to high school understand this principle. The devil is a liar. He wants to function with your mind on the level of fear because he knows fear ensnares. You get it? That's why he says, do not be born to fear. You get it? Or you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Where there is fear, there is bondage. You remember in high school, you sit in an exam, and while the exam starts, 10 minutes away, you see a certain guy going to pick an extra paper. <laughs> Swore. He goes back to sit. And you look, and you say, hey, he's on number one, I suspect. And I'm still on number one. And I'm finishing number one with one page. And as you're writing, you're thinking maybe he writes big letters. And another one also goes, <laughs> picks a paper. Then you're thinking, I think these two write big letters. And then another two or three go at the same time. Then they pick paper. You see? And it's a brain game, but you don't understand. He starts to say, did I read? Am I doing the right number? Is it so? God. Maybe I need to expand my point. You also get up. You fail to write because you don't know what to write, but you have an extra paper. Thank God I had an independent mind. Me? It doesn't matter how many papers you get. I just tell myself he has been made my wisdom. You ask my classmates. I was always a smart guy. If they look for the first five, six guys who did well, guess who is up there? Why? Maybe I write small letters. But I can't be intimidated because another man wrote another paper. Do you understand what I'm going to do? I don't care if he bought a new car. I don't care. I know who I believe. Some people, they just even do their friends and friends tell them, I bought a plot of land and they get intimidated. It doesn't matter. Tell them congratulations. <laughs> Why? Because when you also buy your kilometers, you tell him, <laughs> Praise God! <laughs> it has to happen for you too. It just has to happen. Listen, your race is not mine. But we must all finish well. We must all finish well. I mean, we must all finish well. This world is big. It is too big for ministers to fight each other. Look, how many people are on the face of this earth? Seven billion. Seven billion people. Even if we were to say that each one of us should pass a hundred million here. Each one of us. By the time we pass a hundred million, they've already produced. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The spirit of competition is the spirit of this world. Every time you're in a fix and you think somebody's doing better, check yourself and go back to God. Because there's a problem. That's the very thing that makes you lose peace. And any time you feel that, go in your room and say, I know who I am. I know who I am. I know who is in me. I know what's working in me. I know it must work. It's not pride. It's understanding. Why? Because let me tell you something about the anointing. It quickeneth. It quickeneth. One time I read the memoirs of Grand Sison Finney, and one time he saved the whole city in just three hours. I realized there was a problem. How can one man save a city in three hours? He just went to pray for three hours. And after three hours, he stood in front of a city full of people. And ask them, how many of you want to give your life to Christ? And they all put up their hands. All of them. Almost all of them. Almost all of them. He didn't even preach. He just told them, how many of you want? <laughs> oh God. <laughs> all of us shall hand. What was he praying to the end to have peace that they all must be born again? Three hours of prayer. He just stood in front of a city and said, anybody wants to give their life to Christ? And they raised their hands. 
And almost the whole city. And they said after that, bars were closed, brothels, drinking places, theaters, they were closed. Because one man prayed for three hours. Three. Three. Perhaps you're on prayer mountain. Lord, anoint me. Lord, anoint me. Even 20 members have failed to fill in your cup. Lord, anoint me. Lord, anoint me. Shakarara. Sirin koko. Dimpungu. Sirin koko. Dimpungu. Sirin koko. Dimpungu. And I realize, okay, if this guy reads the same Bible, are you hearing me? If this guy prays the same God, understands the same understanding I have, I must get to a point of God, why is it working for him and it can't work for me? There must be an issue I must solve with my God. That's why I tell you, if anything ever challenges you, eh, go to God and learn, or if you're humble enough, ask that man. Ask him, how do you do it? He tells you, I do this and that and that and that, and that's okay, but be at peace. Just get the point where your end is peace. Just have peace. It doesn't matter who did what. It doesn't matter who got more grace than you. It doesn't matter who got more grace. Don't, don't worry. You just have your peace. Find peace. The moment you go in prayer and you come out of prayer married, never worry. Never worry. From that day, start to act married, think married. Listen, if you go in prayer and come out rich, Start to think rich, start to act rich, start to respond rich, do everything rich. Because there is nothing that can change it. Unless something from the outside comes and frustrates that peace. Oh, what peace we often. You forfeit peace. You forfeit peace. The moment I pray for something and I'm at peace, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what it is. I just position myself to receive. I got the peace that settles it. I don't need more. But how can you live prayer without peace? And then you say, Apostle, pray more, pray more, pray more. Pray more. I also add on your frustration and I also finish when I've not had peace. Let me tell you something. Can I share a mystery? The Bible says in Isaiah, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. The word chastisement there is translated as disciplining. So God had to discipline Christ for your peace. The place of disciplining means if the Bible says he was tempted in all things, yet he did not sin. It means he had a temptation of something making him restless. You get it? He had a point where, listen, you're born and all you're thinking is someday they're going to kill you. You're just... You see, look at abuse. Abuse has a level, and abuse is in levels. Okay? I'll give you an example. There are people who come and physically abuse their kids. Bam! Don't do it again. That's abuse. You get it? But there's an abuse that is just of the word. You get it? Like you remember in high school. Eh? A teacher tells you, I'm going to cane you 50 Canes. You get it? Then you put it in your head that it's going to what? Cane you. Fifty canes. And then he goes away. Anytime you're walking and you see him, your head tells you fifty canes. And he'll just come and bypass you like this. And say nothing. But your head has told you he has said. He comes in class and says, open your books. He's thinking of something, but for you, he's... <laughs> you wish he beats you, and you have peace. Because the torment of having a long life of thinking 50 is also abuse. Why? Because your mind is not at peace. You're thinking 50, 50. And he might never beat you. But until he tells you, I've forgiven you. <laughs> that psychological torture can be likened to a man beaten every day. And that's how marriage is also. Some people in marriage, they torture. You, you see people happy. You know he's torturing. Or oh, she's torturing. You get on kind from. But I didn't abuse him. You didn't. But you're torturing him. Brothers and sisters at home, family, you get it? 
Like one time when I was young, I knew how to pick on my brother a certain way that daddy didn't know. So that he beats me and I say he has beaten me and they beat him. <laughs> and that's the thing about high school. A guy can sit, for example, in class. Eh? And then they invent a simple phrase. Does he get it? And that word is like <laughs> Revelation 2.17. It's known to the giver <laughs> and the person only. Middle ground, nobody understands it. We can even silence it like BB, black baboon. You get it? And then this guy knows that this guy is saying that he's a baboon. You understand? But he knows that there's another acronym that can provide for BB, blue band. Then every time the guy passes, BB, BB, BB. You get it? This guy is enraged. You, you don't know BB. BB. Mumpaku BB. What do I know BB? Anybody BB? I need some BB. But now I got a BB. Well, the word BB. You ain't got a BB. Before you know it, this guy is going to go. Guy on your BB. Why are you beating the guy? He was looking for BB. No, no, no. No, he wasn't looking for BB. He's abusing me, black baboon. No, no. When he said BB, he didn't mean black baboon. That's what he meant. No, no, no. Yeah, he meant BB. And two people fight and you don't know. That's why when you're counseling couples, first understand what is BB. What is? When you're counseling friends, first understand what did he mean by BB? Did he say black baboon or blue band? Or both? Fear brings torment. You get it? You know why I'm giving this example? You can make a man lose peace. Or situations outside can make you lose peace. You get it? Because of how they define certain things to you. God wants you to get past that level. Why? Even if they're saying BB, you're not disturbed. The problem is you. It's not the BB outside. The problem is not who called you BB. The problem is you. You remember Mark 4? I think it's a 30 something verse. The scriptures speak of how there were waves to and fro, and the disciples of Jesus get uncomfortable. You get what I'm trying to tell you? Mark chapter 4. The Bible says, And there arose a stone, a great stone, and of the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. Next verse. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep, on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Why? Because they cared. They cared that they perish. That was a problem. Do you now understand why the Bible says, be anxious about nothing? Can we go back to that Philippines? I want to show you something very interesting. He says, be careful for nothing. Why? Because God doesn't want you to lose peace of anything outside you. If you should pray that that peace comes. You see? And he says, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be known let your requests be known not to thank but thanksgiving precedes request thanksgiving with thanksgiving let your requests i thank you because you have given me a job you don't say god give me a job thank you because you have given it to me no he said make your thanksgiving before the request okay verse seven and the peace Shalom Hebrew Greek Irene. Oh Irene. Okay? And the peace. The peace. The tranquility in your spirit that the Lord has said you need. Which passes all understanding. It means there is no reason to explain why you're happy. There is no reason. You should be hurt. You should be disturbed. You understand? You should be out of line. You should be disappointed, you should be disgusted, you should be something, but you're not feeling it. That peace that surpasses all understanding. The Bible says it shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Why? Listen, the devil knows if you lose your mind and heart in Christ, 
you'll gain a mind in the devil. And you know, the only thin line between the two is to keep your peace. And the only way not to keep your peace, care for nothing. Let nothing threaten you. It doesn't matter how bad the news are. It doesn't matter how bad the news are. They say, you got this, you tell them, sure, I can get it out. You remember that thing I told you, the heart disease. Doctor told me, oh, you have a disease, you're going to die, I laughed. <laughs> she says, why are you laughing? I told you, I can preach it out. That I can fix. Heart, that one I can fix. But they don't go, you have a disease, oh God. <laughs> doctor, doctor, do you know that that day they didn't even want me to leave hospital? They feared I would die before I reached. I reached. Be anxious for nothing. Oh! We fired you. Wonderful. Thank you. Wake up next morning tomorrow and have a peace that passes all understanding. Think with me. God just gave you two weeks to relax, to get another job. You needed leave. I said you needed leave. I'm just resting. So they ask you, oh, I, I got fired. Can you believe I'm the lady who got me fired? No, 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 listen. Listen. You just don't leave. You needed to rest. God needed to get you rest. For we know, not hope. For we know, not pray. For we know, not believe. No, we know that all things work together for good. To them that love him. And according, according to his purpose. Nothing is working against me. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing is working against you. Let him live. Nothing is working against you. Nothing. Everything is working for your good. Next verse. And he arose. The Bible says. And he rebuked the wind. And said unto the sea. Be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. Next verse. And he said unto them. Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Ah, he went back to sleep. I like that kind of guy. I just like that kind of guy. He's my kind of man. Why were you fearing? Apostle, pray. Apostle, pray. Come down, come down. Apostle, pray. That's the thing. You get it? Get to a point when anybody brings any news, you say, what, what's up? What, what, come on, come down. Have a glass of water. Don't, please. No, 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 It's okay, it's okay. We'll talk later. Have a glass of water. But there are people, even if you tell them, even us, as men of God, when you tell them, I need to talk to you, they send an emoticon on WhatsApp with me, and like, ooh, <laughs> of what have I done? The next thing comes with the fear of when, Papa? Now, I'm on a border. Then they come to your office like this. And you tell them, I just wanted to tell you a blessing. I say some people fear prophets. The Lord has told me something about you. Why? Yeah, me, I fear prophets. Supposing they tell me I'm going to die. How do I fix that? Have peace. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. No man can prophesy you dead. Don't even think it. If he does, he's lying. If he does, he's lying. That's my mind. You tell me yours. Listen, I'm dealing with a very sensitive issue. I'll tell you. I have a spiritual daughter. This girl dreams everything. It's scary. For example, she goes to sleep and the Lord reveals to her that an accident tomorrow is taking place at 10 a.m. Ginger Road. She gets on a board that stands Ginger Road and exactly the way it happened in her vision is the way it just... It's just crazy. It's just crazy. You get it? But when she came to me and said, what should I do? I told her, no, 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 no. This is how you do it. The Lord wants to get this out of line by teaching you how to fix it and when he teaches you how to fix it, those days when you go on board and watch it, watch how it's fixed. Just watch. You get it? One time I was in a meeting in Bethel, and there's this girl, one of its church members, and the Lord shows me that she was going to have a crazy accident in just a few minutes from church. I just called her right straight. I said, in the name of Jesus, I refuse death. 
Now, was it the will of God to take her? Maybe it was God who will be and it was her time. I don't believe that. Why? Because it says that the years of a man are 70, but by reason of strength they can have more. If you're not above 70, when you die, trust me, I'll drive at your home and ask for 10 minutes with you. If you're just moving but if you're above 70, I'm like, oh, <laughs> uh, let me try. There, I just try. But if you're below 70, trust me. Are you hearing me? Tell those people who are around you to give us time. Some people, by the time they bring the dead body, they've already removed the brain. You need more faith to first grow brain, kid, no what. Then by the time you draw that, that's when you raise. You disturb us. If you intend to die early, tell your people that word. You know what? If I should die early, First call Apostle Grace, Pastor Zach, and Apostle Emma, and give them 30 minutes. Put it in your will. And after putting it in your will, we reach there and they said, she asked that we give you 30 minutes. We will not disappoint you. <laughs> I promise we will not disappoint you. If there were three men who entered there, they will come back four. But some of you, by the time they get the dead body, the teeth are out, the eyes, the nose. And you say, now how can she live without it? Her brain. How will she be? Hallelujah. Tell anybody nothing should move you. So the problem with Matthew was that they cared. They what? They cared. And Jesus tells them, Why are you fearful? Where is your faith? Why are you fearful? You know, in anything that they bring to your table, rule of the thumb, never fear. The moment you walk out of the line of fear, tell somebody, excuse me, go to your room, lock yourself up, boom. Deal with fear. Because the problem is not the thing, the problem is fear. Deal with it there. After dealing with it, come out of the room, take yourself a cup of coffee and act like nothing happened. Trust me, if you don't fear, nothing will happen. John 20, verse 19. Jesus now meets the men who are born again. Praise the Lord. And the Bible says the same day at evening being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said, Peace unto you. When they were not born again, he would tell the waves, Peace. When they got born again, he leaves the waves, he came to them. And tell them, you have peace. You get the difference? But before it goes outside you. But when you get born again, it's not the guys who are outside who want to kill you. The problem is you. You have peace. Oh God, they're going to... Listen, you, 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 you have peace. Let the rest... Listen, that doesn't matter what is falling apart. Just have peace. You have peace. You have peace. Now... Everything outside be sorted on another platform, but you have what? Peace. And that's why I teach you, when you find a Christian who is restless, first get them at peace. Otherwise you'll never minister to their need. Some people also find that whole jumble and they're great and they also join. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then the third minister also comes in. My God, what's happening? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You understand? And then the whole church, let us pray for Sister Rita. She's going through a trying time. Let's pray. Dear Father, Sorry, she's dying, she's too young, and all of us become victims of circumstance. We pray in fear. In Jesus' name, Amen. Then after 10 minutes, we have had sad news that she has departed. She had to depart. You killed her. You had more faith in her death than life. Listen, when that man of God hears the news about Rita, say, God, we thank you for Sister Rita. Because she's out of hospital. She cannot die. She will leave. Next topic. Let's talk about plants and animals. Because Rita is not an issue. We have peace about her life. Do you know how many kids are killing their mother? Do you know how many mothers are killing their children? Do you know how many brothers are killing their uncle? Do you know how many uncles are killing their aunts? Do you know how many pastors are killing their sons and sons are killing their pastors? By care. Hariya Hachakati. Hello, Me, I don't care. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you understand? Me, I don't care. He told me don't care about nothing. Do you too care? You're killing people every day because your faith is too what? 
care ni to kill why you have attended too much to sickness to disease to bondage listen i don't move by impulse i move by the word it doesn't matter how i feel or you think the moment the word hasn't declared it you can weep and sleep i ain't going to do nothing i'm going to wake up like this one guy who's until they say uh-uh, that man had a careless face yes that's what they call reckless faith how a faith that is a bit reckless you understand when you see your kid has swallowed something no 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 be at peace that you forward if you want to take them to hospital drive at normal speed he promised that you'll not bury your child simu siru he said you'll not bury your child i can't think that my kid can die i can't think it if they kid die they die i slap them out Tell them, what are you thinking, kid? For some person, you don't know a parent and their child. Okay. You also don't know God and you. You don't know God and you. Listen, you're his child. He says, you're the apple. Anybody that messes with you, messes with God. Listen, he's more zealous for you than you're zealous for your kid. Passionate to God is the death of his servant. I mean, he's too passionate. Listen, he cares. That day, I got a vision about my niece. And I wake up and I told my sister, the Lord has showed me that this girl is going to have an attack in her nose. It's going to swell and it's going to cost you a lot of money. So my sister told me, simple, you fix her. She just went to bed. She said, oh my God, oh my God, what is the Lord saying? No, 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 she said, you fix her. You're her uncle. I went to work. I woke up in the morning yesterday. She woke up very early. I told her, Alexis, come to my room. I need, I need to talk to you. I told her, sit here. She sat. I told her, do you know what a vision is? No. <laughs> so I went to the six-year-old and I said to explain vision. So, uh-huh. so I told her, okay, now I had a vision. And the devil was planning to do this and that and that and that. Okay? She said, yes. Can we pray? said yeah i laid hands on her she moved out after 30 minutes the pain i saw two days ago came you understand and after 30 minutes this girl comes with me the uncle it started like you said it's the last of my god and i'm seeing a six-year-old she's really crying she's in pain and at that point i didn't panic i saw her come you see alexis when we pray we believe that we have received the petitions that we have asked for. Okay, because God is not a liar. I explained to this woman, I was explaining to Alexis the mystery of faith. And after explaining, I asked her, are you still feeling the pain now? She says, no, it's gone. It's all go and play. But now if there are some parents, let me see in your nose, let me see. <laughs> they flip the kids' nose. One time we had a friend. At the bank where we were working, Casey Bishop, she was called Judith. Eh? Her kid developed those things they called false teeth. So, they called and told her, Oh, your kid, she's this. So the thing grew, and the kid started to have a swelling. The kid couldn't sleep. The kid lost appetite, got her temperature, and you know, the kid was all. Eh? So, she was planning to leave work, to go and get her kid and take her to the hospital. So, me, I'm just authorizing my staff. She says, My kid, Grace, my kid, my kid. I said, What's wrong with your kid? I said, I come. He sat down. I said, I command it to disappear. I told her, call your mother. Mommy, pastor, you know, come on. You get it? So, the mother checks the teeth of the kid. And the mother is the first one, Catholic woman, she shouted, Oh my God, it has disappeared! This is, it has gone! You get it? And then they start to jubilate, Oh God, it has disappeared. Now, me, peaceful guy, this has surpassed all understanding. It's not news, you get it? Now I'm thinking they've suffered this kid two days of unnecessary pain. Because they don't have reckless faith. You know, he's not going to pray today. He has a flu. We're not going to bring Jason today. He has a flu. The day my kid could have gotten a flu. That was the day they pray. That was the day they what? They should know Jawangi. The moment you say, I never can fruit call one summer. Watch it. Jagala Muleka won't get you okay. Nah, eh? The moment you tell me, eh, eh. Tell your neighbor, stop killing people. Stop killing men. 
Hallelujah. You must have peace at the end of your prayer. You must have peace. And if you don't have peace, don't come out. Don't what? Don't come out until you have peace. The moment peace is there, act peaceable. You get it? Speak of cancer like you're talking of flu. No, it's a slight cancer. Talking about, I remember cancer. No, the wisdom that is from above is firstly pure. And then it's what? Peaceable. And then it's what? Gentle. Then it's easy to be talked to. Raise your hands and speak to Jesus. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.